back on track. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I have a uh, confession to make, um, different in character than Mary Osgood's. Um, so, so the confession is, uh, I gave you some files to examine in a take-home exercise for this class, and I screwed up. I meant to give you some input files, mm -hmm. and I gave you output files. <laughs> I gave you the solutions and not the questions. Um, and as I mentioned to Paul, if I had the time, Paul pointed this out in an email that I received about 5.30 this morning. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the length of my normal morning routine, I wasn't able to, to get you uh, appropriate input files in time for it to be meaningful uh, for you. So I apologize for that. Uh, if you were confused by those files, it was with good reason. <laughs> because those files were showing the solutions um, that I was hoping you might be able to arrive at. And so, um, if you haven't already done so, just turn something in <laughs> that, that you know, struggles with this problem and you'll be fine. Don't worry about the, the particulars of the files. But I did want to cover this exercise in some uh, detail um, because it bears directly on uh, today's, um, today's material and indeed the material for the next few lectures. So I'm going to um, just uh, close these uh, doors. Uh, if we could get the back door as well, um, Chen Yang. So the exercise I gave you was uh, speaking about um, a distinction uh, of great importance when it comes to nonlinear systems and of great importance for this interface between, on the one hand, uh, data science uh, and, and the system science, and on the other, um, the, the practical conduction of, of certain types of analyses purely within system science. We're dealing here with some uh, challenges AV-wise, but we'll bear with them um, uh, so that we can uh, avoid further uh, costing the time. I'll try to sort these out uh, in future future lectures, okay? So please, uh, I apologize for the distortions um, uh, involved here. Um, so <coughs> to, to set context, you recall that through much of this course, uh, we um, explored three, excuse me, four different perspectives on all this. Two of those perspectives were structural, Two of those perspectives were uh, were ones that had to do with the behavior. The two structural perspectives were were characterizing a system um, in a, a crisp, minimal mathematical form. Another was in forms more accessible for human understanding, in, um, intention revealing components, uh, as uh, exemplified by, um, say, uh, ordinary, dip, uh, excuse me, stock and flow description. For the behavioral descriptions, we looked at uh, time, behavior over time, and behavior in state space. And those have gotten us largely to where we are today. And state space, or as it's sometimes, as it's frequently known as phase space, you know, provides this alternative way of depicting model evolution from time plots. It characterizes model evolution um, in a way that helps us understand the underlying state of the system. Right? And, and we're dealing here with trajectories in the state space of a system. And when we look at a sort of model that we saw last time, the types of models, the predator-prey models, for example, that we saw last time, or the models involving uh, um, uh, involving the modified predator of prey with carrying capacity, um, we're dealing with, uh, with systems whose behavior in state space um, will often occupy far a, a, a small subset of the entire state space. So for example, here if we have a, a simple model, this is SIR uh, or SIT for temporarily immune. These are temporarily immune individuals. These individuals lose lose immunity, we have behavior of the system that is nominally in three dimensions. We have three elements of state. 
and we can plot it out like this in three dimensions, right? Um, S, I, and T on the, the, the z-axis here, okay? Um, so this is kind of a three-dimensional depiction of this system, and you'll notice it's curvilinear character. Um, anyone want to guess uh, how, so, so this is showing the trajectory of the system. Uh, in what direction is that trajectory leading here? Yeah, from the corner, and it's spiraling into a stable endemic equilibrium in this case, where where the system is in balance, all the inflows equals all the outflows, um, and we have a system where the net rate of change is zero, and that lies in the so the center of this spiral, the vortex. Okay. Um, now I had noted that with nonlinear models, we have this very interesting feature. That was a nonlinear model, but in, in general, um, when we have nonlinear models, um, we have this uh, very interesting feature that uh, we can have multiple basins of attraction. So within a given state space, and I'll draw a two-dimensional one without privileging it, recognizing that for most systems, um, you know, their nominal dimensionality is far higher than this. Um, we may have different regions of a state space where we have different uh, basins of attraction for each. And the system can be in a fixed point with respect to either basin of attraction. Um, in this area, it gravitates towards this one, that area towards that one, much as a droplet of water might you know, head toward the Arctic Ocean versus the Pacific Ocean versus Hudson Bay. Um, if it's slightly displaced within the Columbia ice fields, and indeed there's a there's a place within a kilometer of each other that those three um, catchment areas are represented, um, and where you know water goes to each of those three destinations. Okay, so this these are uh, different basins of attraction shown here, and there's gravitation towards that. And um, often when we're seeking a tipping point within systems um, through intervention, for example, where we're aiming to kind of bring it to a different um, attractive point. Sometimes we're seeking to bring it towards a disease-free equilibrium, which we can make attractive in the sense that it pulls things in through appropriate interventions like fast enough treatment, more aggressive contact tracing, et cetera. And we've seen some models where this happens, such as that model that showed lock-in behavior and tipping points, such as I showed you, okay? Um, where slight differences uh, in starting points, you could see them right here, um, we're starting at this sort of point um, here and we're proceeding towards one attractive equilibrium or another, depending on which side of this uh, from a slightly different uh, starting, starting point. Um, okay, now I made the distinction in class last time, and indeed in the in the problem between nominal dimensionality and intrinsic dimensionality. Okay, nominal is kind of the the dimensionality with which the system, or as we'll see, the data is given to us. Intrinsic dimensionality is sort of the underlying um, native dimensionality of it. It's it's in fact um, how much of the systems degrees of freedom are in fact exercised in practice. And um, because of many factors, you often find the intrinsic dimensionalities being less small, much smaller than the, the nominal dimensionality. And uh, within the system science area, we have a, a bunch of ways of investigating this for dynamic systems. And we're going to be talking about them in coming minutes. In the data science area, we also have ways of investigating this. For example, principal components analysis or independent components analysis provide us with ways of reducing, of identifying um, sort of underlying structures that uh, account for the um, preponderance of the variance in a full data set. So we may have a data set of hundreds of answers to questions involving health. Um, Maybe it's 500 questions that are asked, but um, the actual variance of that data set is largely explained by
by just you know ten salient patterns. They're people who tend to have these attitudes or these situations, these others who have these ones. And once you total up those ten, you're accounting for ninety nine point you know three percent of the variance or whatever. And this is very common. It's in PCA provides us for linear relationships with a way of, of deriving um, what are these sort of major uh, uh, salient underlying patterns. And we do so through, it turns out, uh, by identifying the eigenvectors of the system. Okay, um, that's, that's for linear systems. Often though, um, in dynamic systems, we have something very similar. We have a system that nominally looks looks like it's, say, n-dimensional. But in fact, if you look at it from the right angle, this is just from a different angle, I'm looking at it, you'll notice it's totally flat. It's in a plane. So I'm, I'm just changing my perspective here. Here it looks, for all intents and purposes, three-dimensional. But if I use the right vantage point, I see that one of those dimensions collapses down. It's not exercise. This dimension perpendicular to this plane, which is illustrated here, is not exercised by the system. It's not, it's not a degree of freedom that it's taking advantage of. And therefore, oh, sorry. Um, I did. Apologies, Jamal. Um, <coughs> If people need to come in, they're welcome to come in near the front, which because I am mobile in ways that not everyone is. Um, um, okay. Uh, last time we introduced a system which was a variant of the predator prey pro, um, system. And uh, this alternative had carrying capacity. And one of the ways in which it was different is it, it um, was resilient. It was resilient not in a static way, returning to a kind of static equilibrium, but a way that returned to a, a dynamic, what I referred to informally as a dynamic equilibrium, a situation which was periodic and recurrent, but and, and in that sense like for predator prey, but the difference from this, from the original predator prey model that lies yet on the board, was that this original predator prey model um, did not exhibit this phenomenon of resilience. If we increase the number of prey, for example, here, it would occupy a new orbit and it would circulate around from that orbit. Um, if we increase the number of predators or decrease, it would change the orbit in a persistent way, but it wouldn't bounce back to its original state. Here, with carrying capacity, it does. It's, it's got a groove that where things are balanced appropriately and it's attracted back. So what I actually did was to take that model from last time, um, which I, I, I have up actually here, and I, um, I perturbed it, okay? This was the model in an un- Perturb. Oh, hey, hey, hey! Get back here. Um, I saw it for a moment, but now it eludes me. Um, there was actually a nice, uh, nice output with it um, here. Uh, so let's let's try this. Boom. Um, okay. Um, there we go. So, oh, I can see it, but you can't because of the AV dysfunction. Um, I could ask you to imagine it, but that wouldn't be nice. Um, uh, so here we, hey, oh man, um, this class is really exciting. Um, well, okay, at least for me. Um, okay, now, now we have something really interesting going on. Um, um, <laughs> just look at it. Um, <laughs> so, wow, that's, that's, Okay, I, I, well, I'll be, um, do you think this is like normal behavior? Um, okay, let's, let's try, let's try suspending it for a moment and let's try coming back. Maybe it will write itself. Um, 
here we go. Ready? <laughs> okay. Um, and, ah, okay. So there, you still can't see it. Um, it's like the snuffleupagus. Um, oh wait, where is Wade when we need him? Um, I don't know that anyone else will remember the snuffleupagus. Sorry? Okay, okay, good. Good, you know, you're in good company then. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, so here's an example of this model that we saw last time, right? We, we had a model that exhibited this dynamic equilibrium, with res which was resilient, and if we started it from a different point, it would spiral out towards that point, and although I didn't show it, if you started it outside of this boundary, it would spiral in as well. And it would reach this groove state where it's kind of at a imbalance. And so I took this model and I engaged in perturbative behavior. Um, so I actually, I actually set it so that every time step it would perturb the state by, um, by a certain small amount, uh, but discrete amount. And so we'd be adding to the prey or adding to the predators. It's like every year we bring a few predators in or a few prey in. And I perturbed it. And, and so now we see a system that is stochastic, um, but built around the same system. And it is resilient enough that it it's keeps on pulling it back to the same basic orbit. These are actually fairly big um, perturbers perturbations given you know the size of the scale here uh, prey and predators but it resists um, uh, it resists these perturbations it bounces back it comes back to the same basic equilibrium much as our bodies do following about with uh, with uh, pneumonia or flu or what have you um, of course at a certain point in life and this is true for elderly for example um, about with the flu may bring them down to a, a very adverse uh, um, equilibrium that ends them up in the hospital or worse. Um, uh, here it bounces back. Um, and indeed many phenomena in the world, I argue, are, are related to this phenomena. They're, they're not static uh, phenomena. They're not phenomena that just go to some static equilibrium. There's a dynamic change, but there's a rhythm to it, and the rhythm is self-restoring if it's disturbed. Okay? Um, so, with that digression involved, what I will say is I will now return to this point about the dimensionality. Okay? Um, we saw that as a kind of um, exemplar model last time, and I noted that it took place in a nonlinear system. Um, um, now, within this, these nonlinear systems, uh, there is typically significant coupling between different variables. You see it even in the predator-prey example here, where, where prey depend for their evolution on predators, that's the y, and where predators depend for their evolution, their population dynamics on prey. And when we're in the context of nonlinearity, we can't separate those. We can't separate them into solitudes. Um, the fact that they're entangled has informational consequences of great significance for data science pursuits. Because information about one part of the system will often encode information about the other. If we know what's going on with predators, it tells us a fair bit about what's going on with prey. Like if predators are dropping really quickly, it may tell us, okay, prey are comparatively, um, comparatively rare. If predators are shooting up a number, it tells us there must be abundant prey, or else predators wouldn't be able to reproduce at that high rate, okay? So, turns out that this, in, in, a, in a twist that I demonstrated last time, Turns out this can be demonstrated easily algebraically. And in fact, the, the results of it are on the board here. But you can see it up here. Um, given this first equation, we can solve for y as a function of the behavior of x. 
But you'll notice it's not of x alone, it's of x dot as well, the change in x, or the rate of change of x. But the point is, using information only about x, we could, we have information encoded in there. It's implicit in there. The information about x fully specifies y. And about y fully specifies x. Each one is, contains sort of in a holographic way, a full picture of the other. Because of their coupling. Because of their coupling. This is not a linear system which we can decompose into eigenmodes, each solitudes that evolve on their own, and we don't have to worry about, um, about one for the other. In fact, this is a system which is so highly coupled that just giving me one piece of it tells me about, uh, about the other. Okay. Um, in that case, do we have like a value, um, like a number to, to best us evaluate how coupled the system is? How coupled the yeah. system is? Yeah. Well, uh, it's a good question. I'd have to think about that. Certainly, we have something that can be can give an element of that, which is this issue of dimensionality. If we, if we have a system with nominally a certain dimension and because of the coupling involved, not because of symmetry or, or conservation, the, the intrinsic dimensionality is half of that. It tells us there must be such heavy coupling that it's lowered the dimensionality. In terms of a metric for coupling, there are metrics for coupling that we use with uh, differential equations um, among elements of that system. Um, but, uh, and, and many of those involve feedbacks, but it's interesting. Um, I, I don't know of one measure that's exactly what you're looking for there. Could it be? I have complete conviction that if someone in this room were to decide to do you know, research on this for a year or two, they could probably come up with a nice crisp number, okay? Um, by the way, Chin Yang, this is an earlier version of the model you're working with, right? The West Nile okay. system dynamics model, um, uh, built by Karen Yi and Wan Yi An. Um, uh, so, w when we have these systems that are coupled in this way, um, knowing the behavior of one state variable tells us the value of the others. It, it tells us, you know, and encodes values of the others. Um, and I could go into this, but because I have, I have some distance to go today, I, I don't want to dwell on this. You could look at these if you're looking for particular examples, okay? Now, one of the things I really want to drive today, though, is to move this discussion from talking about situations where we know the model. I mean, after all, in this case, we can solve for one on the basis of the other because we know the model structure. We have a complete knowledge of this model structure and that allows us with confidence to be able to say what this variable might be. We have a theory and the theory, if, if we have great conviction of the theory, we can solve for, for one variable and part of the other, okay? Um, but it turns out, and this is gonna be key in the next bunch of lectures, this is gonna be a, a key recurrent point, that there's a lot of cases where we don't know, we don't have the requisite underlying theory about the world. We, we don't know the structure of the governing factors shaping processes in the world. But it turns out, and this is something of great significance, um, that while the examples we've been looking at are based on model-based series where we know the situation, um, the same thing is true for empirical uh, time series. And uh, we're going to be able to use the techniques which we're exploring here when we know the underlying data generating process for cases where we don't. And, and uh, this can give us insight on the one hand into the, uh, the underlying drivers for the system, can help us identify uh, causal drivers uh, that are operating, but it can also help us reason about 
more efficient um, data analysis strategies and help us infer from one part of the system what, what might be going on on, on other parts when we do have uh, some, some grounded uh, theorizing about that. Okay? Um, so with this introduction, um, I'll just note we're going to take this in the area of embedding. But before that, I want to go into the examples that I asked you to examine and in this challenge. And this challenge had to do with quantifying intrinsic dimensionality. Okay, so we have we have these state spaces um, in which we have some trajectories. Okay, um, so one of the examples I ran through my my uh, code. Uh, for for today for that exercise was actually generated by a an agent based model with hundreds of agents evolving over time and outputting data um, that were counts of individuals with certain characteristics. Okay, um, and uh, maybe you want to imagine a high dimensional system. One of the challenges about lecturing about these materials in a in a way that's compelling is that um, it's hard to draw in more than two dimensions in a convenient way, um, although one can make approximations for three. Um, and it gets very hard for us to visualize more than three dimensions. Um, you know, maybe with four, you can imagine a time varying 3D object, but, but um, that kind of limits the you know, the, the, um, the, the generality of the example shown, and I'll ask you to work within that because uh, it's not a reflection of their limitations so much as ours in terms of our visual cortex and reasoning abilities. Okay, so if we have a system which it may be very high dimensional, like hundreds of agents, it may be somewhat lower dimensional, um, maybe I'll just for, um, uh, for the sake of sort of concrete reasoning, think about a system like the predator prey with carrying capacity where it's resistant and where small perturbations lead back to this manifold. So I characterize this as a manifold. It's kind of a thin, thin area of the system where um, it only occupies this, essentially this curve, a fairly thin curve within a higher dimensional space. This thin curve is closer to one dimension. It's closer to one dimensional in the sense that um, there's it really has a length, uh, but um, although it it happens to be bent around in a two D spe uh, space, it really has more length than than kind of width of this um, of this trajectory. Um, or you could think of uh, a piece of paper. Um, it's a sign of our digital age that I, I, I lack uh, just pieces of paper I can immediately flip out. Yeah. But in my bag of tricks, there we go. There we go. Um, oh, thank you. So here's a you know, two-dimensional surface within three dimensions, right? This may be characterized, embedded in three dimensions, and maybe may um, exhibit three-dimensional curvature and so on. But I would argue that in terms of its sort of nature, it exhibits length and width, but um, other than sort of some bending, it doesn't really have a Z dimension of significance. It's really X and Y that dominate. Um, thanks, thanks, Tom. That's very helpful. Um, by contrast, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, uh, by contrast, um, this would, be, <laughs> this would be something that's closer to 1D in, in three dimensions, right? It has a, it has a length uh, uh, associated with it, but it doesn't have too much width or depth, right? And maybe I can, can I bend this? Who's this? In? Is it this audience? Can I bend it? Sure. Okay, am I allowed to bend it? Here it is, it's it bent a little bit, okay? Um, so that's in 3D. Um, but 
it's intrinsically, I would argue, 1D. It's basically a 1D object that just happens to be to be introduced into 3D context. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So um, I had described to you a technique for determining from data intrinsic dimensionality. And this technique will be very useful when we have no models around, but I actually generated data for it using models of different sorts. Okay, um, uh, And we'll, we'll take a look at this. But the technique basically involves um, it's, it's one approach to measuring dimensionality. There's actually several. There's a thing called Hausdorff dimension and box cutting dimension, etc. Um, this is just one technique. It's not actually super privileged. There's a simplex technique, which is based on prediction. And we've used various of these techniques in our, our work here. I think we've used three major techniques. This is one I find particularly um, easy to uh, have an intuition for. And the basic idea behind this technique, um, uh, does anyone have a piece of paper I could borrow? Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, the idea behind the technique is, um, is a simple one um, at an intuitive level. The idea is, look, if we're, we're going to consider, um, consider a point in space that's on the curve of interest, or on the surface, on the structure of interest, okay? Um, so it's a data point. Take it as a data point, okay? I'll describe it as a data point. Um, consider how, as one goes, different distances from that point, the number of, or I'll say the fraction of points represented grows. So as, as we go out, maybe, maybe this is the point right here, right? Um, this, is, this is the point. I'm, I'm tempted to mark it. Um, this is the point. As we go out from here, um, within the context of the nominal dimension, Say three three dimensions here. As I go out, imagine a little ball growing. Okay, the ball is growing of radius r, and it starts at zero, and I start growing it. How will the number, the fraction of points, grow as that radius of that ball grows? Okay, I would argue that that in it's something that's basically one dimensional. I'm tempted to to, to roll this up even more tightly, um, but. But I, I should have brought hair color. Sorry? I should have brought some hair color. That would be awesome. Um, although you might have to teach me how to use it. Um, there, there we go. Okay, this is a little bit better, right? Um, as we go up uh, as a radius grows, I would argue here, more and more of this is going to be included, right? The, but the ball's going to be sticking out <laughs> in multiple dimensions, right? This ball is going to be going to be, uh, yes, it's going to be covering a growing amount of this, but it's also going to be growing out this way, right? It's a bubble. Um, and, and the bubble is going to get bigger and bigger. How does the number of points grow? Well, I would argue for a structure like this, it basically grows linearly um, with this. The number of points will grow. If I double the size of the bubble, will I get more points? Absolutely. If I double the radius, I'll get twice as many points here, okay? Twice as much of this structure represented as with that half that, that radius. Okay? Um, and therefore, for, for something like this, I would argue the number of points um, or the fraction of points represented for a given radius r is proportional to, this isn't an alpha, this is proportional to uh, r. Okay? Um, if I have double the radius, I'll get double the number of points, so double the fraction of the structure represented, double the fraction of the data points represented. Okay, and for pedantic reasons, I'll make it R to the one. Okay, that's all. Right. Okay. Now consider if I could progressively unfold the topic, the two D structure. Right. Um. As, as the ball, imagine the ball originating here in the center as it grows. Um, 
more and more of this structure, a greater and greater fraction of it is, is of all these data points on here are captured, right? How does that grow up? Well, if we imagine all these data points, imagine there's a fine grid and counting the number of data points represented there. I would argue that the number of those points that included the number of grid, grid intersections, as it were, is actually not going to rise with linearly, it's not going to rise to the one power of r. It's instead going to rise to what? Two power. Yeah, it's going to be the area. What's going to determine the number of data points there is the area. When it was when it was all rolled up like that, right? Um, when it was all rolled up like that, the number of data points, you know, along there was was only going up linearly because uh, they were basically all spread out in that axis only. This way, they're spread out along these two, and so it goes up with the with the square. So this would be for like a, a 1D curve, right? Um, and if I had a 2D structure, um, a 2D manifold, then, then the fractional points represented as R rises goes up as R, anyone? Square, right? Um, and and if it's a 3D structure, maybe maybe we'll take this. Okay. Um, alternatively, you can imagine a ball growing in my head. Um, um, hopefully, my head is a third dimension. Um, uh, hopefully, it's a fourth dimension too. But um, okay. So if there's a ball at the center of this thing and it grows, um, the number of of sort of points, if we imagine a, a, a sort of grid or an equally spaced sort of set of data points in this, the number of those points will rise with the with the cube with the with with um, r r cubed, right? Um, uh, by the way, for those for whom English is not the first language, um, we, we use we use we, if we say r cubed, that doesn't mean it's a cube. It means it's to the third power. Okay, I, I well, I mentioned this because there was a very memorable occasion where um, a student, uh, a son of the Middle Kingdom, in fact, um, uh, got very, very confused by this description because he thought I was saying there was a cube growing um, when I was saying no, it goes up as the cube power. But he didn't know what cube power meant. Like it goes up as the cube of R. He didn't know. He, all he could think of is a cube with equal sides, and it, it disturbed him greatly. Until we suddenly, suddenly he realized, oh, you mean all you mean by cube is R to the third power? I said, yeah, that's how we say it in English. It's R cubed. Um, anyway, so it goes up. And in general, if we have something of d dimension, this is going to rise with um, r to the d, okay? Um, the number of data points will rise uh, that are incorporated in a, in a ball of growing dimensionality where the ball itself is conceptualized as being in the nominal, in some nominal space, will go up as, as r to the d power where d is the intrinsic dimensionality. I'll, I'll call it id here. The intrinsic dimensionality of the underlying structure. And again, this is not the only way we measure dimension, but it's a uh, it's an easy way, and that's what I've asked you to undertake within the within the assignment is is undertake this code, and I did so partly because at least some of us in the room think it was really a fun little little uh, bit of code to write, um, uh, particularly if you. Um, if you choose your 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 uh, abstractions appropriately, so let's let's go over and and uh, check it out if we could here. Um, okay, so uh, I wrote it as I am wont in Scala here, and maybe I'll I'll just uh, uh, make it make make it larger, right? Um, so um, here I and I'm gonna have to deal with this. Uh, Dysfunction. Um, okay, so this is oh, this is my Scala. Yeah. Okay. 
So, um, so basically, I computed, I actually did this in two different ways. First, I did it exhaustively, and then I did it, uh, 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 then I did it uh, in a way that was sampled. Um, uh, so, so for random samples, basically I gave it a vector, a vector, a vector of a double. So we basically have rows, each of whom is a vector of doubles, and I gave it a count of samples. Okay, I'll, I'll be giving this code to you so you can uh, can look at it. And then I had a count of samples here. Um, whoa, whoa, come on. Um, Okay, this count samples over here, and that's an integer, okay? And what I basically did is I broke it into two pieces, divide and conquer. I created uh, um, a set of uh, distances, and then I computed the cumulative probability for, for a given relative distance. So um, I, uh, I computed the distances uh, by here. Okay, this is actually right, yes. Yeah, that was that was cool. Okay, so I generated um, random pairs of points of indices of points. So I generated indices that were random between zero and the count of points available minus one. Um, I'll see if I can uh, uh, can drag this over uh, here. Um, okay. Uh, and maybe I'll make it a little bit smaller here. Um, and basically, I, I then took those indices, um, so it's a stream of those pairs of, of indices, and then basically, I, I mapped it to take the Euclidean distance between the vectors and the corresponding rows, okay? Um, so with these indices, um, I took the vectors at those indices, so this is one vector at one row, this is another vector at another row, and I took the Euclidean uh, distance, and that's a stream of Euclidean distances where each such distance corresponds to that pair of indices that specify the rows. And then I took uh, from that stream the first uh, count samples of it, and I turned it into a vector. So this basically takes in the data. This uh, Basically, I'm taking in the data. I'm picking random um, rows from it and taking the, the Euclidean distance uh, between those vectors, and I'm doing so using strings um, uh, because uh, I found it uh, very convenient to do that. And then I computed the cumulative probability for those distances. Um, so having those distances, I then turned it into uh, the cumulative probabilities by another step, and that's what this one does. And let's go see that. Here we go. Um, uh, there it is. Um, so for that vector of distances, I basically found out the average distance so that I can normalize by it and the sorted distance and the count of distances. Um, and then, oh, uh, this is cool. Um, right. Um, so uh, so these, these distances, I zipped each one with their index, so I, I, I grabbed that distance and had its associated index. Um, and then I grouped by things which have the same distance, right? Um, and then I, uh, for those things which had the same distance, I took the maximum index. So if there are multiple things with the same distance, I, uh, I, I had the largest index associated with them. And then I normalize that index by the count of all distances, and, and that gives me basically what fraction of points lie at or below that, that distance. Um, and uh, that gave me the cumulative probabilities uh, for, for a relative uh, distance for these things. And this is, um, right, this is all, so it's pairs of, of distance and fraction of points that lie within that, that distance. Um, that, was, uh, that was neat because the indices give you sort of how far along it, it, uh, it is. Uh, oh, I sorted them before. This is the sort, the sort here. Uh, sort there. Uh, sort, sort there. Okay, so um, anyway, that's, that's how I did it. And uh, I then took a look 
at some examples. Um, and unfortunately, I gave you the results rather than giving you the the actual um, uh, the actual problems. But basically, I created a set of these things that were um, uh, of known dimension, and I examined their intrinsic dimensionality. And let's go see what the the results and the little problems were. Here we go. Um, okay, cool. Okay, so, oh boy. Um, hey, come on. Um, we will, there, uh, hopefully get it. There we go. Okay, so, so um, these are on the x axis. The distances relative to the average uh, distance, and it's a log scale. And the y-axis is um, the fraction of, uh, of points that lie um, less than or equal to that distance. And I show here four different curves. Each of those curves is associated with a certain um, uh, a certain data set. It's a data set that I came up with, uh, and I did so with a chosen level of dimensionality. Okay, and I'll show you how I came up with that data set. Um, some of the data sets actually uh, that I used this with originated from Dynamic Systems, but the first set I used for these, in fact. Um, were just generated um, uh, generated uh, directly. And I will show you those here. Um, so they, they're down here. So here are my various mystery, uh, mystery ones here. And uh, basically I took, took a data set and here I, I took a random point for the first one and then the second one was just one minus that. The third one was just twice the second one. And the fourth one was one minus the, the sum of the first two. Okay, um, the, the random one and the one, one there. Um, and so here, how many, how many degrees of freedom really are there in this? If you consider this as a vector, V1, V2, V3, V4 is a vector. Uh, I, I, I sort of return it as a vector there. How many degrees of freedom are there really in that? Sorry? There, it turns out there's just one. It's just this random point. The others are totally determined by this. The others are a function of this. They're just formulas based on this one. So there's one degree of freedom. This is the only thing which really is the material thing that can vary. These others are totally given by this. So there's only kind of one way it can flex. Uh, all the others are dictated by it. Yeah, the levy. Well, I have, what, like how come one minus one? So oh, just that part. okay, so I'm giving back. So this is for testing purposes. Oh. I'm creating some test data. The test data is nominally of dimension four. It has one, two, three, four components. This is vector. And I apologize, you probably haven't seen Scala before. So, um, uh, uh, well, I'm impressed you haven't fainted because of the beauty of it. Um, but, um, <laughs> um, these other students have, have uh, previously been exposed to that. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, what what the instructor lacks in aesthetics, the code makes up for. Um, so, so this is a four-dimensional, nominally four-dimensional vector. It has four <laughs> elements. But here, only one of them is, is, is really varying. The others are totally determined by the first. There's only one, as we say, degree of freedom here. The others are totally dictated by this first one. Um, so given the first, you know what the others are. So there's only really one intrinsic element of dimensionality here. It's this first one. The second one I designed, so it would have two such elements of, of dimensionality, uh, of, of degrees of freedom. And the other two were determined by that. The next very 
unimaginably, I took three. The next yet, I took four degrees of freedom. I generated them randomly uh, for the for the true degrees of freedom. I said, okay, this is, you know, they're in, they're independent of each other, right? Um, so th so this one at dimensionality two, oh, yeah, intrinsic two D. These are all nominal four D, but they're all intrinsically uh, different. Um, so one D. 2D, 3D, 4D. Now, I did something special, though. It, well, for me, it was special. Um, you may not, you may consider it unspecial, but um, I created a nonlinear 1D one as well. Um, the idea being, I wanted to test how did this perform with a nonlinear relationship between these other elements of the vector. Um, nonlinear dependencies on this uh, uh, the degree of freedom. So in other words, would that appear like a higher dimension because it was not a linear relationship, it was a nonlinear relationship. So I did that as well. I produced 1D in a linear way and a nonlinear. In other words, in the linear way, all the other uh, elements depended linearly on the one that we had and the others it depended nonlinear, like with powers and reciprocals and various nonlinear forms, okay? So that's what I did. I created these and uh, I then computed the, um, the dimensionality. And this is what I got. So anyone want to guess what's the, what's the one dimensional one, two dimensional, three dimensional, and four dimensional one here? So if we consider, so imagine this on the x-axis, as the distance grows, that, that size of that bubble, the radius of that bubble grows, um, what fraction of, the, of, the, of all points do we gather at different distances? The fraction of points is shown in a log scale on the, the y-axis here. The, the distance is on the x-axis. So for higher dimensions, does the does the um, so it's, uh, does the number of points included within that ball at its point of its rate of maximum rise does it rise quicker or slower? At its point of maximum rise, does it rise quicker or slower? Let me ask this. I mean, if you if you were to plot out two curves, this is R, okay. Never mind the log log log. Let's just imagine this is R, and I'm going to write, you know, uh, some function of R. So it's going to be R versus R squared. So if I'm going to I'm going to draw this is not long linear. This is and it's not log log. It's just this is R, right? I'm plotting R on this axis. What does R squared look like? So suppose one is here. What does R squared look like? Okay. So it rises as a parabola, right? It rises with the square of r. That doesn't mean it's a square. It, it means it rises with the, with the second power, right? Um, where does it cross this one? Or do, is it always above it? Does it, does it go like, like this? No, if, if r is less than one, which is bigger, r or r squared? Suppose r is 0.5. If r is 0.5, I just told you that. What is r squared? 0.25. So which one is bigger? R is bigger when r is less than or well when r is is one, right? It goes like this, right? Something like this, and that's what you see here. So anyone want to guess where which of them is for r one to the one power? black one. Which of them do you think is R to the four? Purple. Well, magenta? Magenta. I learned that in my 40s. Um, I think I learned that at the Public Health Agency of Canada during a boot camp. Oh, that's magenta? Oh, okay. Um, great. Um, uh, and then uh, here we have R to the so it's a 2D and 3D. And, and this makes, 
this this sort of jives uh, with it. We see a, a faster rate of growth once it starts going up here compared to these with slower. So here, this is not model dependent. We're not in, deter in determining this, these curves. We are not no. We're not using the structure of the data generating process. We're simply calculating based on the characteristics of the data, the location of pairs of points, as we scale up the size of this little bubble, um, what fraction lie within that. And what you'll see is that those that have higher intrinsic dimensionality, of higher number of degrees of freedom, um, are distinctive from those with lower. Okay? Um, now, these were not generated by a dynamic uh, model. These ones were generated by the code you just saw. It was just, you know, I generated these things. Um, if you draw this for a dynamic model, you will see similar uh, structure. And we'll be spending uh, some of next time looking at that structure. But before we get to that, I want to take a look at linear versus nonlinear. This is looking at the um, same curve for, on the one hand, a linear versus a nonlinear dependence. Uh, so, so we're looking at vectors where there's one degree of freedom and all the other, they're, they're embedded in four dimensions nominally. But all the other uh, indices depend on the one degree of freedom either in a linear way, I think that's the black, or nonlinear way, that's the red. And this is showing the corresponding curve. And I would argue that, especially given that this is 200 data points that I've sampled, it's not you know 200,000, it's actually very close close match between these two. What it's suggesting is that the intrinsic dimensionality, the intrinsic degrees of freedom here are indeed essentially the same. And they are. They are. L linear or nonlinear doesn't matter. You've got basically same type of information packed in to this structure. Um, it's, it's the same basic intrinsic dimensionality associated with this. Okay, now, in my closing 10 minutes here, I want to reflect on the fact that whilst we've been examining this for cases where we know the underlying model, we haven't depended on it in the code here, but we, we, we know the underlying model, um, that's generating, say, an agent-based model generating, you know, output, we'll see next time, or, um, uh, or you know, here, results from, from these models with certain known degrees of freedom. In each case, while this, this particular um, algorithm doesn't depend on the structure of that model, we just have data from data points generated um, and we put it in there. When we have used data points from a dynamic model, such as um, uh, data points from, I'll go back a few slides, um, from SIR here, um, uh, from, from this, S I and T, right? Um, uh, or this, predator and prey. It's all nice and good that we could look at this and maybe by plugging in data for a given predator and prey counts, we can compute intrinsic dimensionality. Uh, sure, and that's what I've done in my agent-based model. I've, I actually had a report from the agent-based model the number of predators and prey over time and it reported the total number of predators in the model and the total number of prey in the model. Um, we could do a similar thing with Wade's models of pertussis. 
uh, agent-based models of pertussis, and we can compute the intrinsic dimensionality, and we might find it very small, and in fact, I'll argue that you will. I'll explore this more. But there's something, if not unsettling, then I would argue unsatisfactory about that, in my view. Sure, it's great. We can assess the intrinsic dimensionality. We can ask how strong is the coupling that that implies. That's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. Um, but it's a real limitation, I would argue, if to assess the intrinsic dimensionality of a system, we need to know, we need to have a model, a complete model, and an accurate an accurate model of the full system. Like, how do we know that the model of mosquitoes for West, you know, for mosquito population is a good model? How do we know if, for all his the many virtues that recommend him, uh, Wade's model of pertussis is a is a good model? How do we know that the model of predator prey from which I generated this data? Is, is a really good model. If we have to depend for our, um, for our ability to analyze real world data entirely on a certain model, it makes it a bit more fragile. But the great power of what I'm talking about here is that, in fact, it is not beholden to the model. It's not to eschew the values of models. Models are very important, but it's, it's a delight if in our work our results could, could be independent of model assumptions, could be not beholden to, not limited to, not contingent upon the structures of models presumed. And this gets us to take in some betting theorem. Which is going to have really big implications for us. And Taken's embedding theorem argues that independent of whether you know a model or not for a system, if we have a coupled nonlinear system, it is the case that that information about the system, so if we, if we have a given variable, take it predators, information about all the dr things driving predators is encoded within the values of, uh, that we have over time, the observations of predators. So, Regardless of whether or not we know what the structure is of the system that's generating it, we have confidence from Taken's theorem that all the information needed to reconstruct what's going on on areas of the system driving the, the point we, we do have, say, number of predators, is encoded in that number of predators. That information is packed into this data that we have on the number of predators. We may not know what the generating system is, but all the, the information needed to understand what's going on there, in fact, if we have a long enough sequence of data and a frequently enough sample to, of predators, we can know what's going on in the rest of the system. Okay? And, but it takes it a step further than that. It assures us that that's the case, that we can reconstruct the structure of the state space for a couple dynamic system using a single time series, um, we can reconstruct the state space driving that time series. Um, and this has been proven uh, mathematically by Flores Takens back in the 1980s. Okay. Um, so, not only did Taken show that this is indeed the case, that, that um, we can reconstruct what the state space is. He showed us a way to do that, to undertake that reconstruction. And, and the basic idea here is, given an observation from the system over time, why? Let's suppose it's the number of predators, for example. 
okay? Using just a single, maybe it's a single variable from the system. You can go through a mechanical process called delay embedding that will take that single variable and produce for you a reconstructed state space. Okay? And the mechanical process we go through to reconstruct the state space that is driving this variable we do have, whose measurements we do have, is as, as follows. Okay? So given an observation vector of y, basically delay embedding, this reconstruction, mechanical reconstruction procedure, involves for each time point, which we have sampled in y, we create a vector, a vector of a certain length. And we're going to call the length of this vector E in general. It's, it's occurring in an E dimensional space, okay? Here it's actually, I should have written it as E T minus, uh, T minus E minus 1 times tau if I were, if I were looking ahead. Um, uh, but here there's a, we basically go through and we create for each time point in the time series, a vector. And that vector consists of successive elements that start with y of t. The first element of the vector produced for time t is y of t. But the next element is t minus some delay, which we'll call tau. And we'll be coming back to tau because it's fixed here. Okay? So you'll do delay embedding with a certain tau, say tau 1 to simplify your thinking about it. So, so imagine we're dealing with time 1,000. This is the, for each time point, we're going to get a vector. And that vector is going to be a point at state space, okay? And some reconstructed space space. So for, the, for time top, for time 1,000, we're going to get a vector. And if our embedding dimension is three, this vector will be of length three, okay? Our embedding dimension is 4, it'll be a length 4. The first element of that vector for time 1,000 will be y of 1,000. It'll be the observation at that time. The second element of that vector for that time point will be y of t minus tau. And let's suppose we have tau 1. It'll be y of 1,000 minus 1, or 999. That will be the second element of the vector. That's a number. It's the observation at time 999. The so, yeah. So, so what do you mean of embedding dimension? Embedding dimension is I'm going to, to, to undertake this mechanical procedure to reconstruct the state space of a system from the observations of one variable, call it y. I have a, I have a time series. Of it's a scale, a time series of scale. So for each bit time, time zero, time one, time two, time three, I'm going to have an observation. So maybe it's the count of prey, of predators observed, right? Taken's embedding theorem is going to give me a way of going from that time series into a reconstructed state space. I'm going to see a picture of the state space that's reconstructed just from this time series. It's going to look like this, okay? But I'm going to produce this having only observations of I. I don't actually know, suppose I don't know how many people out there are susceptible, how many people are temporarily immune. All I have is Y. I'll be able to reconstruct this state space that is driving Y, okay? Um, and in order to do that, I will need to undertake that reconstruction within a certain as a certain dimension. So in other words, the, the state space that we are reconstructing um, will be in a certain dimension. Here it's three, okay? It's it, yes, it's it's related to n. I think it's n plus 
and plus one. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in other words, what Taken's theorem tells me for a given embedding dimension how to reconstruct the state space in that dimension. Okay, it actually doesn't tell me the best dimension to use, and, and we're going to discuss some implications of that. But um, it will allow me to reconstruct the state space in in a chosen dimensionality. So if I want to choose a state space dimension of three, it will reconstruct it. If I choose a state space dimension of 10, what I'll find is that it's, it's very sparse. You know, And even here, if I reconstruct it in three, I might find if I look at it, it's actually the reconstructed state space only exercises two of those dimensions. But Taken's embedding theorem will reconstruct the state space in a in a dimension of your a count of dimensions of your choosing and that that dimension the count of dimensions or the number the number of dimension the number of axes in the dimension you choose is called e it's the embedding dimension okay so here it would be 3 but i might decide later it's wasteful because in fact it's an intrinsic dimensionality of only 2 I could actually reconstruct it fully in two. But in general, I'll have to choose an E, an embedding dimension. And these vectors will be of length E. Okay? This vector is of length E. That's what it's. Taken's embedding theorem gives me a way of turning my time series Y into, into a set of vectors for each time point T. I'm ignoring details with the boundary. Um, you get back a vector of length e that's a point in the state space. You've reconstructed. And what are the elements of that vector for a vector at time t? Well, the first element of the vector is just y of t. It's whatever was measured at that time. The second element of the vector is y at t minus some tau. So maybe tau is 1, in which case if t were 1,000, the first element would be y of 1,000. The second element would be y at 999. The third element would be y at 998. And if, if e was 3, it's three dimensions, that's all we worry about. So at time 1,000, this would be y of 1,000, y of 999, y of 999. For time 2,000, this would be y of 2,000, y of 1,999, and y of of 1,998. Um, if y were 2, this would be y of 2, y of 1, y of 0. Hmm? So for each time point, module boundary effects, uh, we're going to get um, we're, we're going to get a vector. And putting those vectors together, that's going to give us the state space. <coughs> Okay, that's, that's one thing it gives us. It's going to give us the state space reconstructing. What was the state of the system that's driving the, the, the predators, the, comp the predators, okay, so, so why? And, and by allowing us to reconstruct the state of the space space, we can understand how the system is operating. We understand its state space picture and we can actually then start to do all sorts of interesting things. We can ask about its intrinsic dimensionality. That's one thing we'll be doing. We can ask about the, the character of that, that state space. For example, are the multiple basins of attraction? But very importantly, and arguably the most useful thing we can do, is we can determine what variables are causally driving what other variables. And that is an absolutely huge issue right now in data science. Being able to understand not just associations between variables, what predicts statistically another one and where there's a statistical dependence, but in what cases one variable is driving another one causally. It is causally governing it. It is, it is influencing it. And we'll be able to drive this through through Taken's approach, <coughs> okay, using CCF, and we're we're coming up to that. So, Taken's embedding theorem lets us go; it lets us reconstruct state space, not merely, not merely, ladies and gentlemen, when we 
when we know the full state of the system. I and mean, for this, this is completely routine transcription, right? If we, if we have a model and we want to draw it at state space, it's a piece of cake, as we'd say, right? It's just you plot out for each point here, you plot out, you know, you pick the uh, S coordinate to be the value of that at a certain time in the model, the Y coordinate, the value at the same time, the Z coordinate or T coordinate for the value at that same time and you plot it, right? Completely straightforward. But what Taken's embedding theorem gives us is this ability to go from data about only one of these or about some other thing that's not a state variable. It's just an observation about the system. Maybe it's the sum of state variables. Maybe it's one state variable divided by another. Maybe it's it's some other you know quantity. It can allow us to reconstruct the state space as well. Okay. Um, so Taken's embedding theorem is a mechanical process. Mechanical in the sense it's turned the crank. If you have observations, why? A, a time series of observations, we can turn it into a reconstruction of the behavior of the system over time for all the factors driving that variable y. Okay? That's what this allows us to do. Now, having done that, we're going to be able to, um, to then get all sorts of insights about the system. This is an example of it here, for example, and we'll come back to this next time. If we have time series on x, y, and z, for example, um, uh, if we happen to have time series for all of them, we can construct portraits of the underlying system. We can construct a phase space diagram. But it turns out from one of them alone, from x alone, we can construct the same basic pictures. Because in a coupled system, coupled nonlinear system, the information that's encoded in one variable, say x's, uh, x's information, can determine the understanding of the others. And that's what this is taking about. We can we can reconstruct it. Here on the board, we did so knowing about the structure of the system. We, we know what the governing equations are, so we solve for them. Here, with Taken's Medic Theorem, we, we may have no clue what the governing equations are of the system, but we can reconstruct the state space in, in with a, a fidelity like we know what the underlying, the underlying, we have complete information about the system. Um, as it relates to the, the, you know, here X, the things that drive X. So in short, this provides us a way of, of holographically reconstructing whole areas of the system from <coughs> one piece of the system. And it's because in these coupled systems, um, that information is encoded. So we're going to build on this next time. And we're going to use this in different ways. One of the ways will be to assess sort of the degrees of freedom of the underlying system, intrinsic dimensionality. Another way will be to establish causality. Um, and uh, in other cases, we may wish to understand something about the sort of the, the, the system uh, evolution as a whole. But fundamentally, this will be about, from a data science perspective, having greater richness of repertoire because we realize that data about X alone is not about X alone. It's not limited to telling us about at this part of the system. It whispers to us about the whole system if we're just willing to listen to it. It will tell us a world of information, and I don't use that term lightly. It will tell us all about the things that drive it, um, distal or close by in the system if we just are willing to listen and use the right methods to, to make that listening precise. So that's what we're going to be, uh, to be looking at in, in coming days. And we'll find that while you might treat X as having totally different data characteristics than Y, because they're close cousins, because they're just different facets of the same underlying system, um, 
you can use that information to, to better understand uh, each, better understand what's driving the system, um, and uh, could use it uh, in principle to, to much better predict system evolution or, or an understanding of the causal structure of the system. So that's where we're going for next time, okay? And I think I'll ask you to undertake a reconstruction of this sort so you can see this for yourself using the sort of models that we've been creating. But uh, I keep you, uh, keep you over. So um, thank you very much and I appreciate your patience as we work through the audiovisual dysfunction. <laughs>